Ah, hello World Wide Web, I'm Dr. Shadow, the internet personality with the best hair, and welcome to week four of... And today we will be continuing our look at the uh, very unique movie series of Resident Evil. With Resident Evil Apocalypse. Released two years after the first, Resident Evil Apocalypse is at least the first movie in the franchise where they knew what they were going for from the start. Written by Paul W.S. Anderson, he understood that this was going to be an official Resident Evil movie. The studio didn't want it to actually follow the story of the games, and it was going to star his wife, Mila Jovovich, as an unstoppable force of awesomeness. And because this was written as a Resident Evil movie from the get-go, they could incorporate people, places, and things from the games in the movie. Even if not necessarily doing it very accurately. In any case, Resident Evil Apocalypse incorporates aspects of both Resident Evil 2 and Resident Evil 3 Nemesis into its tale. Raccoon City has fallen, and a dwindling few members of STARS try to escape, both to show the world what the evil Umbrella Corporation has done, and to simply not die. This is made slightly harder by the fact that they are being pursued by a hulking monster! Nemesis! Not to worry, for Alice is back, and even stronger than ever! which is still accurate to the original video games, if you have a game shark. But let's take a look at Resident Evil Apocalypse and see just what horrors await us. We open up to a little recap. Just so y'all know, Mila Jovovich plays Alice, she worked for Umbrella at this secret biological weapons facility called The Hive, and last movie, shit went tits up real fast. The T-Virus got out, everyone turned into zombies, and only she managed to escape. Along with Matt, but then they got captured by Umbrella hazmat dudes. He's mutating. I want him in the Nemesis program. Which might leave some of you wondering why this movie is called Resident Evil Apocalypse instead of Resident Evil Nemesis. Well, the studio decided that the benefits of being associated with Resident Evil 3 Nemesis were outweighed by the risks of being associated with Star Trek Nemesis. Take her to the Raccoon City facility. Then assemble the team. We're reopening the hive. I want to know what went on down there. I did. Didn't you already do that last movie? Wasn't, wasn't the whole plot that a team got together to open the hive and go down and find out what the hell went on? I mean, I know this movie is from the early 2000s, that was before iPhones were a thing, but cell phones still were, and the internet. Oh well, the doors are sealed on their T-Virus research lab, and the two folks that got out were clearly attacked. One was mutating, no way to know what happened unless you crack the hive open again. Oh, would you look at that, there's T-Virus swarming all over the place. Also, CCTV was a thing, radio communication. There were plenty of ways to let other people know what was going on. But we've got an apocalypse to happen. A Resident Evil apocalypse. With no time to spare, black SUVs speed through neighborhoods, collecting important Umbrella personnel, such as Dr. Ashford, played by Jared Harris, and his daughter, Angie, played by Sophie Vavasour. For the record, the zombie outbreak hasn't necessarily really happened yet, and the movie never established that this truck driver got bitten Resident Evil 2 truck driver style, so I'm just gonna go ahead and assume that Raccoon City has the same quality of drivers as Texas. So the drivers are fucking dead, but Angie is still twitching. No time to check if she's alright, we've gotta move on to introducing more characters, such as the perpetually badass Joe Valentine, played by Sienna Guilordi, and the comic relief LJ, played by Mike Epps. No, no, don't shoot! I'm leaving town. I suggest you do the same. Jill just found the most cold-blooded, badass way to tell everyone that her plan is to say fuck it and leave. But back at the second secret umbrella lab in Raccoon City, Major Kane, played by Thomas Kretschmann, turns off the automatic sedatives being fed into Alice, resulting in the ending of the last movie. She wakes up, no one's around, and when she goes out for some fresh air, she discovers that Raccoon City has been completely destroyed by a zombie apocalypse! Where is everyone? Well, they're at the security checkpoints. 
Conveniently enough, Umbrella just so happened to build a big fucking wall around the city that no one seemed to question before now. For ease of filming, we're only going to be using one of the security checkpoints. While that cuts down on sets, it does lead to some serious traffic congestion. This gets so bad, they call for reinforcements. Don't know what that's supposed to help, but it does introduce us to Umbrella's best buds in uniform. Carlos, played by Oded Feher, and Nikolai, played by Zach Ward. Subjugating the public sounds fun, but they see a woman in trouble. So disobeying the direct order, Nikolai assists Carlos in operation, literally swoop in to save the day! Shooting zombies left and right! All to save a random woman who was already bitten. There's no going back! No! Oh, I understand the nihilism at that point, but y you gotta remember, you still have the T-virus. All this means is you're gonna wake up as a zombie with all their limbs broken. Now, nothing to do but head back to the bridge, which is where we find Jill Valentine meeting up with her old longtime friend Peyton, played by Razaka Doti, who doesn't necessarily exist in the games. He's, he's kind of written as a new character, but in the role of an established character, he's sort of the stand-in for Brad Vickers. So, uh... Spoiler alert, I guess. As a zombie bites Peyton, and Major Kane makes the command decision to seal Raccoon City off from the outside world. Now to just let the crowd know that if they don't leave now, they're gonna fucking shoot him. Do it. Use of live ammunition has been authorized. And to really hammer the point home, they handed the mic to the guy with a voice. Live ammunition has been authorized. Prepare to have your assholes perforated. So they must run away from the gunfire and towards the zombies. And the gunfire, as Carlos and Nikolai are there fighting the undead horde. For now, as Kane orders a full retreat of all Umbrella goons operating within the city. But the evacuation hits a snag when Dr. Ashford says he will not leave without his daughter! They're like, dude, she's probably dead. But he will not give up hope. With that, they... Let him stay behind. But when he attempts to log into Umbrella at Hotmail.com, his authorization has been revoked! Oh well, that's nothing that Umbrella at Hotmail.com slash Hackerman can't fix, which he uses to log into his own account. Really not worried about leaving a digital trail here. And he digs through the city's camera feeds. This segues nicely over to Alice walking into a convenient gun and clothing store. Sadly, not Kendo's. And suiting up before collapsing. That's because, as it turns out, she has been given the T-Virus in a flashback! Up the dosage. Just do it! A lot of the T-Virus. Sucks, man. She spent all last movie avoiding getting bitten, only for it to just get injected to her off-screen. As Ashford continues his search, though, we move over to the church where Jill and Peyton are limping along, along with a stranger, the reporter, Terry, played by Sandrine Holt. Heading inside to find cover, they immediately meet Mackenzie, played by Jeffrey Poundsett. He's a bit on edge, but they calm him down fast enough. But weird noises are about. So, going to investigate, Jill discovers there's a zombie in the back, tied up and being fed. By the priest, played by Sean Austin Olsen. Just leave us alone. <laughs> Though in the extended cut, they first meet the priest when they just walk into the church, and he comes out talking about the end times fire and brimstone and all that. And then they hear the weird noise, and Peyton takes him off, and Jill goes to investigate, and then the priest just teleports into the back anyway. Hearing the gunfire, Terry decides to say fuck it and leave, but they are surrounded by zombies! The power of Christ locks the door, but they soon realize that they are not safe inside either, as there are liquors about! So Mackenzie runs off! Oh gee, miscellaneous character is all alone, surrounded by monsters. I wonder what's gonna happen to him. <laughs> he winds up with only slightly more screen time than the priest. Oh well, free gun! Now that the miscellaneous characters are all fucking dead, Jill can return to the pews with the important group. Her friends, and of course, the three liquors. Yeah, still regular liquors, despite what they said in the last movie. Now that it has fed on fresh DNA, it will mutate. It's kinda weird. I'm not used to monsters in sequels actually ending up with less powers. 
but it's still more than enough to take these three out. Peyton has no ammo, and Jill can't take on all three. But you know who can? Mila Jovovich! Launching her motorcycle at them, she backflips off it and shoots the gas tank, killing one liquor and wasting a perfectly good motorcycle. Blasting away with her dual fully automatic submachine gun, she somehow managed to get up a civilian gun shop, she smashes another with a cross. And then it's time for the shotgun coup de grace! <laughs> What's that, Jill? I got blood on you? Well, sorry, while you were standing there dumbfounded, I was kicking ass. Elsewhere, Carlos' squad is still pinned down. But what's this? Yuri, played by Stefan Hayes, has been bitten by zombie Ben Moody! That's bad, but it doesn't mean he's going to be left behind by Carlos or his best bud, Nikolai. They don't care if he's been bitten. They don't think that's a reason to shoot them. Unlike Alice over here who's like, Hey, Peyton, couldn't help but notice that limp. It'd be better to put you down now before we get too attached. Jill, however, refuses to allow this. If it comes to that, I'll take care of it myself. Yeah, after Alice showed up, we gotta give her something to do in this movie, otherwise she's just gonna be standing around there like, Wow, Alice, that was really amazing. I wish I could do awesome things like you and Alice. They're like, of course you can, Jill. You can like and subscribe. That helps a lot more than people think. <coughs> It's a good thing they came to an agreement here, in any case, because suddenly zombies come up from the graveyard! How? Fucking how? They're literally avoiding the virus by being underground, and in sealed coffins, and being far too long dead to reanimate. That, uh, whatever. They run from the long dead while elsewhere, Major Kane capitalizes on this crisis to activate the Nemesis program, which he seems to have done after completely forgetting about his orders for the Umbrella troops to evacuate, as that is what Carlos, Yuri, and Nikolai have been attempting, following an Umbrella helicopter, expecting a ride home, but instead finding big damn empty weapon cases. We don't need weapons, we need evacuation! These weren't meant for us. How do you know that? Maybe this is your evacuation plan. Get that big damn wall around the city? Rocket jump over it. But Yuri bites Carlos! So they have to put him down. Much like the Texas Ranger up here is dropping zombies from the comfort of the roof of the building. This is also where LJ has wound up after wandering around Raccoon City. Shit! Maybe I was safer outside. Goddamn, those police reflexes be kicking in. This is just the cop's way of saying hi. They do offer him a weapon, but he's got that covered. But before long, Nemesis arrives! And we find out just what kind of a threat he is. Shrugging off bullets like nothing, and blowing their sniper the fuck up! Major Kane orders Nemesis to eliminate all the STARS officers, and so he does, blowing everyone away with a minigun! Except, of course, for the comic relief, as he wasn't a specified target. So what kind of a threat is Nemesis? He's pretty much the Terminator meets Predator. But what is Alice? Jill wonders, as Alice is clearly so much more badass than Jill is. Alice explains that Umbrella did something to her in their secret labs. But oh darn it, the phones keep ringing! Unable to avoid the noise any longer, they answer and find out that it's none other than Dr. Ashford, doing his best to keep this plot moving. He can offer them a way out, if they save his daughter. Also, in case they don't feel like it, maybe the fact that the city is going to be nuked at sunrise will put some pep in their step. It's bullshit! No fucking way would they get away with that! It'd be all over the fucking news! Cover up. Cover up is ready, prepared. Meltdown at the nuclear power plant. And nuclear meltdowns are clearly not the same thing as nuclear weapons, though when has a clear violation of well-known facts ever stopped the movie? Or a news story. So they head out at once! Perhaps a bit too quickly as Peyton is gunned down by Nemesis. Knowing how squishy, piddly-ass Jill Valentine is, Alice tells her to run, and Alice moves to distract the monster. Confusing Resident Evil for Super Mario, she super jumps away from his rockets, fleeing into a building and slipping down the garbage chute, causing Nemesis to lose track of her. Oh my god, Alice has been an AI this whole time! 
Ah, well, just straighten that out and no one will notice. Jill's not doing much better trying to hotwire a car, but these tasks are so difficult for her. It's made even harder when Zombie Peyton attacks and she has to kill him. On the bright side, this opens up a spot in her friend circle that LJ is more than happy to fill. Thus, when they reach Angie's school. We're gonna have to split up to search this place. Jill decides she's gonna get another one of them killed to see if she can make another friend real fast. Handing Terry a gun and telling her to just wing it, she heads upstairs in search of Angie Ashford. But when she does find a little girl in the school, it turns out to be a little girl zombie who summons a whole crap ton of other child zombies that just pop in out of nowhere, surrounding Terry and killing her. <laughs> Turning her demise into a found footage horror film. A fate worse than death. Hearing her cries of pain, Jill heads in to see if she's alright. Seems all the zombie kids have conveniently left the movie, leaving behind a convenient Angie. And yes, this is the same room as Jill grabs the camcorder while she's at it. On their way out, they try to cut through the cafeteria, but it's full of zombies. Jill says that's no problem, but it's full of zombie dogs! Things look bad, until Nikolai swoops in to save the day! Seems he and Carlos got a call from Angie's father as well. Will he be Jill's new friend? At your service. Come on! Wait! Angie! Save the girl! I've got this bitch! No, but through it all, Nikolai has a heart of gold and will sacrifice himself so that Jill can bring Angie to safety! The biggest joke in this whole review. Uh, for those of you out there unfamiliar with the games, uh, Nikolai? He was not a good guy. Here, his final good deed is making sure the dogs are fed, which means the dogs are still after Jill and Angie. Not to worry, Jill has a plan. They're in the kitchen so she can turn on all the gas stoves, and when they run for their lives, she can light them ablaze! But oh darn it, her match went out! Not to worry, for Alice is here, flicking a convenient cigarette super cool style, and grabbing an emergency thermal blanket, blowing the dogs up, and keeping the others from getting so much as singed hair. That out of the way, they can hammer home a few plot points. Hey! Angie's infected with a T-virus! Also, so is Alice, but the movie's specific way it works for them is it means they kinda psychically know this about each other. Angie's lunchbox is chock full of antidote. Convenient, as Carlos is here too, and he did just so happen to get bit earlier. Should've told me you got bit, motherfucker. I'm hanging with you and shit. Oh, I'm sorry. Nikolai was a self-sacrificing hero. Carlos is the asshole in zombie apocalypse who keeps it secret that he's been bitten. Point is, they got the kid, so Dr. Ashford tells them how to escape. A handy dandy helicopter! Though the helicopter crew isn't expecting them, so they might need a little, uh, negotiation to get on board. However, Dr. Ashford's control is cut, because Major K knew what he was doing the entire time! You really thought I didn't know. Yeah, hacking into his own account made it kinda easier to figure out, but, um, if you knew, it means you were letting him, so, uh, why? I mean, we wouldn't have a movie otherwise, but it would help to have a little motivation. Either way, they've got a helicopter waiting for them. So knocking out a sniper and grabbing a cable, Alice runs the fuck down the building and beats the crap out of everyone below. But before they can hijack the helicopter, Major Kane hijacks the scene, capturing Carlos, Jill, LJ, Dr. Astrid, Angie, and giving Alice an ultimatum. You see, she's a lot more like Nemesis than you think. He's built for brute strength, and she's more for lean agility and intelligence. Kane would like to know which one is better. So, orders Alice to fight Nemesis to the death, or he will kill one of these innocent people. What makes you think I care? Really shoot Dr. Ashford, the one who is the most valuable to the Umbrella Corporation and the least important to Alice. And you could have shot literally anyone else and it would have been better for you and worse for her. But maybe that's to keep the thought of him doing that as an incentive to get her to do battle with Nemesis. And it's been true this whole time, but I really need to bring it up here. The action in this movie, well, the editing ain't all that great. It's got a lot of quick cuts, which aren't terrible for long-range encounters, but in melee combat, it's a massive jumbled mess. As we could see coming, while Nemesis is a formidable opponent, Alice is Mila Jovovich and manages to beat him in combat. But realizing that inside there somewhere is still Matt from the last movie, she refuses to kill him. 
This means when Kane decides to clean up the rest of the characters with an order to Nemesis, surprise, Nemesis kills Kane's men instead. That's right, kids. Nemesis is a surprise good guy. The rest of the characters break out of their binds and begin kicking Umbrella ass. They don't give up so easy, though, and when they bring in the big guns, the final heroic act of Nemesis, powered by love and friendship, is to sacrifice himself to save the people. And it likely goes without saying, but for those of you unfamiliar with the video game, Nemesis was not a good guy. <laughs> Very not a good guy. Anyway, the heroes get to the chopper, Major King gets tossed back into Raccoon City, and Zombie Ashford takes a bite out of him, and the heroes run as fast as they can from the biggest damn explosion they can! Still cutting it close as the helicopter crashes into the mountains. But when Umbrella goes to investigate, only one body is found. Alice's body. Uh, well, uh, point is they got the footage to the world, so everyone knows how evil Umbrella really is. Except for one problem. New evidence now which discredits earlier reports. This is nothing more than a sick joke. Fake videotape now totally discredited. Nothing more than an elaborate hoax playing on the very real tragedy which overwhelmed Raccoon City earlier this week. And it seems despite the mountains of verifiable video evidence everyone has and can see, the news just says it's all fake, it's a bunch of hooey, you don't have to worry your pretty little heads over that. Nothing to see here. <laughs> and they did something like that in the movie. Well, after that, we're gonna need something to cheer us up. How about a butt-ass naked Mila Jovovich? Looky here, Alice is back! Cloned! Or healed in a pod, I'm not sure which, but whatever it is, she's got serious memory problems. My name... is Alice. And I remember everything. Oh, scratch that, make it past tense. So she beats the crap out of the science types and escapes! only to be held up by mountains of Umbrella goons. But what's this? Carlos, Jill, and LJ have all shown up, posing as Umbrella operatives. Not a big stretch for Carlos. To officially handle the Alice situation. However, there is still the security checkpoint on the way out. Let them go. But they actually WANT her to escape! and just let her beat the crap out of a bunch of their men just to, you know, keep up appearances. Because now she is the predeterminator, and Umbrella has control. Ish, I think, uh, maybe, well, whatever the fuck it is, the end. After about eight endings in a row, I hope one of them worked out for you. Anyway, that was Resident Evil Apocalypse. Are we sure they knew what they were doing before they started this one? On the one hand, it's much more clear that this was intended as a Resident Evil movie from the start, with several characters from the games that find themselves in similar situations. On the other, there's more than a little artistic license at work here, filling the shoes of established characters with brand new faces and turning characters established as pure evil into self-sacrificing heroes. On the plus side, the liquors are just regular liquors again, and they didn't mess with the monster lore too badly. Having the T-Virus give Alice superpowers is Odd, but hell, Mila was going to be doing backflips and snapping the necks of hordes of monsters anyway. At least they gave an in-movie excuse for it. As far as the movie handled Jill, it was alright. Sienna did a phenomenal job on the performance and looked great in the role, looking like Resident Evil 3 Jill Valentine more than the Resident Evil 3 remake did. She does have a tendency to get overshadowed by Alice, though, which isn't great for fans of the video game series. And speaking of which, as a fan of the games, I have to say that the way they handled Nemesis was... Weird. Turning him into a cross between the Terminator and a Predator, and uh oh yeah, not having him transform into a bigger monster in Act 3, when that is actually part of the power set in the games. While the acting was fine, and I did appreciate the practical effects, the shots where they didn't add moisture to the suit really made it come off looking like an incredibly elaborate Halloween costume. At the end of the day, Resident Evil Apocalypse is a decent follow-up to the original film. It's more Resident Evil than the first, while also being less. But at the very least, it's a lot of fun to watch, coming in at three explosions out of five. Though it was also the last one I bothered to see in theaters. Thank you all for watching, I've been Decker Shadow, and remember, if your battle-hardened friend leads you to a zombie horde and then tells you that you need to split up, they were never your friend. Okay, I have to have reviewed something else related to video games. Ah, Detective Pikachu. Yes, I did actually review that. It's right there. 
Or you can check out whatever random crap YouTube recommends. Which might actually be more related to Resident Evil, now that I think about it.